Liz, thank you so much for being here today. Excited to have you. Katie, thank you for having me. It's a really important topic that I'm so excited to delve into. We're going to talk today about cognitive load. And cognitive load may sound kind of scientific, and it is a little bit. But if you understand it deeply, you can really start to make changes in your environment that make the work easier and make patient care safer. Great. You ready to jump in? Let's do it. Awesome. So how this works is we're going to delve into specifically what is cognitive load. Okay. Cognitive load theory was developed in research. It's scientifically based. It's almost the same for everyone, you, me, nurses in the care environment. We'll look at the factors then that contribute to cognitive overload because cognitive load is constant. Anytime we're learning something, experiencing something, we experience cognitive load. Cognitive overload, though, is when we start to have problems. It's also where we can introduce solutions. We'll look at how a heavy cognitive load impacts nurses and patients. So we'll look at the, the, the factors, the way that we can help to mitigate that. And we'll look at those solutions that help minimize cognitive load so that nurses can focus on the things that matter most. And specifically, we're gonna delve in at the end to, into how technology helps to lighten cognitive load. Because technology can often be a factor in cognitive load, but yeah. if it's designed well and implemented well, it is part of the solution. Great, well, let's keep going. Excellent. So let's start with understanding what cognitive load is. Great. So cognitive load is about how your mind processes information. And this is true if you're a nurse, true for you and me, true if you're a doctor, true for every person. And basically, when you think about cognitive load, you think about the amount of working memory required to take in information, process it, make sense, and take action. And so you can imagine if the right amount of information is coming at you the right way, that's easy to process. Mm -hmm. But when there's too much information, it's disorganized or there are lots of distractions, that's when it becomes problematic. And that's because everybody's working memory works in about the same way. Yep. Our working memory is designed to hold small amounts of information for short periods of time. So on average, our working memory lasts roughly 15 to 60 seconds. So by the time I'm finished telling you, your working memory will have let it go. Yeah. Right, And it can also hold only an average of four to six items at one time. And that is why, if you can imagine there are lots of distractions or competing information, new information can knock out older information, which is why you forget things. And in a patient care environment, that can be problematic. Absolutely. So let's look at the three types of cognitive load. Okay. So first there's intrinsic load. Intrinsic load is the level of cognitive effort that's basically inherent to any okay. given situation. There's certain amount of information, there's certain things you need to process. You can't really change intrinsic load, but it is impacted by people's uh, stress levels, okay. by whether or not they are experiencing big emotions that stress is making it hard for them to regulate. Got it. Right, so that minimizes how easily you can segment and process that information. Yep. Next, there's extrinsic load. Now, extrinsic load is all the things in your environment that are competing for your attention, competing for your emotions, distracting you from the task at hand. Yep. So you can imagine extrinsic load is often things that are somewhat, at least, in our control. Right, so imagine you're a nurse and you're having a busy intake. You're taking in a new patient and there's information coming at you from left and right. Yep. That might distract you, but if you can minimize some of that distraction, then you've lightened the cognitive load. Got it. The last area is what's called germane load. And germane load is the amount of effort that it takes to process that, that information that you're taking in. So germane load has to do with whether or not you've experienced situations like this before, right? So for example, nurses and doctors practice codes. Yep. That way they've been through the experience, they know who's going to be in what role, they know the information that's going to be conveyed and how it's going to be conveyed. That makes it much easier for them to process it. Nobody's wasting cognitive effort figuring those things out while a patient is in distress. That makes sense. Liz, when does cognitive load become problematic? So cognitive load, as I said, happens in every situation. It's problematic when it moves from manageable load to cognitive overload. So Katie, generally some level of cognitive load is unavoidable in a working environment. We have information coming at us and we have to process it. 
Yep. If you think about a nurse in their environment, though, they've got so much information coming at them. That information is often incomplete, and they have to quickly triage that information and figure out what actions are most important and what to do while still remembering the things from yep. a minute before. When there's too much information coming at them, they lose their ability to segment and process that information. You can imagine that's when they forget things, that's when mistakes happen, and it starts limiting their ability to focus and keep managing all of that information that's coming at them. Liz, I've seen so many nurses that have been in situations like this where there's constant stimulus coming at them. What does it look like when this persists over time? That's a great question, Katie, because that's actually when it gets really problematic. You can imagine for a nurse, it's normal to have a shift where things feel a little bit overwhelming. But if that happens repeatedly because the environment isn't designed right, then they're starting to experience lots of errors or mistakes. They're starting to feel the depression that comes with that. They're starting to feel burned out. They feel consistently overwhelmed. And that's when the care quality starts to go down. They feel less satisfied in their work. And that's at least part of the reason nurses are leaving the profession and we're experiencing the shortage we're experiencing right now. Liz, that's so interesting. Well, let's make it real. Great. Let's let you experience what cognitive overload feels like. I apologize in advance for this, but let's do an exercise. And if you're watching at home, you can do the same thing along with us. You just need a pen and paper. Great. You've got a pen and paper there. So I'm about to show you a bunch of letters. Okay. I don't want you to write them down when I show them on the screen, but I want you to try to remember them. Okay. And then once I take them off the screen, you'll write them down. Okay. You ready? Let's do it. Okay. Here you go. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. See if you can write them down exactly the way they were on the screen. Okay. Okay. Let's see. How do I do? What you wrote, A L P K E X B E I P A. What it actually was, you were close. You got a lot of the right letters, but not quite in the right order or grouping. So it was A L P O K E X R B E P A. Okay. Now I'm going to show you the same letters in a different grouping. So what I want you to do is take that paper, put it aside where you can't see it. Okay. And we're going to see another set of letters. This time, again, I want you to remember them. As soon as I take them off the screen, you'll write them down. People listening at home can follow along. You ready? Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> You can do this. <laughs> Trickier than it looks. Okay. Okay, let's see what you got. So you got ALP, OKE, XRB, EPA. You nailed it. Well done. Now, the letters I showed you the first time were exactly the same as They're the letters the I showed you the second time. Okay. The difference is the first time they were grouped into five groups with those extra letters on the ends. Five is harder to remember than four. Okay. Also, in this set of letters, there are some things that are familiar. The word ALP actually spells a word. If you're watching in the U.S., EPA is the Environmental Protection Agency. So you have some germane load factors that help you remember it, but also it's less of a cognitive burden. You're able to basically unify that into those four groups of three and remember it more easily. Okay. So you can see it's the same information, but how your environment sets you up and what we've designed into it makes it easier for you to remember. That's, That's the difference between cognitive load and cognitive overload. Make sense? Absolutely. Thank you. Awesome. So let's dig into why we have so much cognitive overload in nursing environments. Okay. It's not because people designed it that way on purpose. Okay. But what happens is we've got a couple of different factors at play. One is we don't have enough nurses. We need more nurses taking care of more people. Now, there are a lot of reasons that we don't have enough nurses. Some of it is we have an aging workforce. Some of it is we're not training enough new nurses. Some of it is the impact of COVID-19. Nurses have left the environment because they've experienced too much cognitive load or cognitive overload. They've experienced moral injury. They've experienced other things that are too deep to go into here. But when more nurses are left carrying the burden of those who have decided to leave, even if that's a perfectly valid decision, 
that means they're carrying more load themselves. So that's a two-way street. Yes. But it's not just that we need more nurses. We also need to have systems that are designed recognizing the normal human limits of cognitive ability. If we consistently put nurses in the situation where they're overloaded, then they're going to get those, experience those symptoms we saw before, depression, frustration, um, even uh, that, that sense of needing to leave their work. So they need to have systems designed with cognitive load in mind. And part of how we do that is we involve nurses right from the get-go in the design of, of technologies, of processes, of protocols, and of the way that the work gets done in nursing environments. So all of these factors I heard you touch on lead into depression, sleep deprivation as well. Well, the cognitive overload leads into that, but it. it's whether or not we've set up systems that are likely to create cognitive overload okay. or whether we've designed in a way that it minimizes that likelihood as much as we can. Got it. Excellent. So let's look at, you just talked about the way that, um, that systems are designed that way. Let's look at the way that we can reduce cognitive burden in the care setting. Okay. Because it's not inevitable that nurses experience cognitive overload all the time. Okay. So first, we're going to break it into two different pieces. There are two sides of addressing it. Now, cognitive overload is mostly about the way that systems are designed. Okay. And that means that the answers to cognitive load come from leadership decisions, system design decisions, technology implementations, those sorts of things. That's fundamentally where the work is. Okay. And nurses are not just subject to what happens in their environment. They have some control in this as well. And so what, what I'm going to do is touch quickly on some of those individual factors Great. and then spend most of the rest of our conversation looking at the system factors. Okay. So from an individual perspective, nurses can mitigate some of their cognitive overload experience. I mentioned before that factors such as sleep deprivation or um, fatigue or uh, just stress yeah. can help to uh, make it harder to remember things and, and increase the likelihood of cognitive overload. Yep. So practicing good self-care is important. In addition, nurses can learn the kinds of tools that are designed to help minimize cognitive load. That might mean when they're doing a patient transfer, they follow a protocol such as SBAR, Situation Background Assessment Recommendation. Okay. When they are giving information and receiving information in a structured way like that, they know what to expect they know how to process the information. Or things like uninterrupted medication pass. Yep. Medication pass is such an important and error-prone situation, you don't want any distractions coming at the nurses. So creating a process where that can be uninterrupted is essential. They can make sure they learn how to use the communication tools that are available as well as possible, right? Okay. So if they're using the technologies as effectively as they can, they're not going to be spending energy on how to use the technologies. And finally, they can be advocates for system change. Even if changes need to happen at the leadership level, they, when by learning the language of cognitive load, learning to identify the factors that are making it hard for them to manage the information, they can start to speak to leaders in a way that they understand what changes are necessary and possible. Empowering them to advocate for system change. Absolutely. Okay, great. And one thing I wanna be really clear on here is I am advocating here for self-care, yep. and I know self-care can be a touchy subject, but it, Absolutely. it's really essential, and the reason it's touchy is that burnout is ultimately a workplace injury. We need to be making changes in the workplace, but those changes in the workplace are going to take time, and in the meantime, by caring for themselves, nurses make themselves both more effective, less likely to experience errors and distress but also better advocates for that system change that needs to happen over the long run. Absolutely. So Liz, are you saying that personal wellness can attribute to cognitive burden? So yes, I'm definitely saying that personal well-being is part of cognitive load management. But I want to be really clear, because ultimately, as cognitive load contributes to burnout, burnout is a workplace injury. And what it requires for a root cause change is to change the way that the workplace works. Okay. But that change is going to take time. And so nurses do themselves a huge favor if they can pay attention to their own well-being in the meantime to help manage that intrinsic cognitive load mechanism in their own, through their own well-being. And it also makes them better advocates for system change. That makes a lot of sense. 
So let's talk about system change. Let's talk about what that requires. Yep. And this, we're going to spend a little bit more time here, so I'm going to walk you through what we're going to go into, Great. and then we'll go into each of these pieces. So part of how people can manage system change is by unifying communication channels. Communication is so central to how nursing work happens that that's a great place to focus. It means when we have mobile care teams, they need to be connected at all times. It means looking at things that extend nurses into the care environment, even if they're not right at the bedside. It means looking at care models and saying, just because we've always done it this way, should we continue to do it that way? It means identifying tasks that can be offloaded from nurses onto other qualified care team members or even onto patients and families. And it means empowering nurses to manage the process of patient care more efficiently. So you ready to delve into each one of these? Let's do it. Okay, let's start with communication. So nurses raise communication as a challenge so often. And it's usually one of two things. Either there's no communication or there's too many communication channels. Yeah. When there's no communication infrastructure, nurses are running around even yelling from patient bedsides to get access to the information they need or the people they need. More commonly, there are too many communication systems. And so you get what are called communication islands. In that case, you have nurses using one communication system. They need to use something else to reach physicians, something else to reach pharmacists. And you can see how that adds to their cognitive burden because they not only have to manage the communication, but they have to think about which communication channel to use and yeah. often wait for a response on it. Right, So it's not only inefficient, but it's using cognitive resources in ways that don't serve patient care. Got it. So in addition to that, the, the devices that they use in the care setting are often not hands-free. And so that means they have to think about how to put down the communication device or pick it up, and that just makes it that much harder for them to manage communication effectively. It also needs to be integrated with other systems, Okay. right? So imagine trying to send a message about a patient to a doctor or a pharmacist, and you've got to write down, you've got to make sure they know that's the patient you're talking about. So you have to put that into your text, say it over your call, whatever it might be. But if you have an integrated system, it can append to all that information for you. Okay. And so that's effort you don't have to take as a nurse to make that communication happen. Liz, that's a really great point because nurses are always on the go, which makes communication all that much more complicated. How does that contribute to cognitive load? It totally does, Katie, because when you're moving from place to place, you're not using the same communication systems all the time. And in fact, team structures are actually shifting now as well, which means that where traditionally you've had one nurse overseeing four, five, or six patients, now one nurse is often overseeing a team of LVNs, LPNs, and patient care techs who are being their hands at the bedside. Okay. So you can imagine if one more qualified, higher trained RN is overseeing all of those people, there's a lot of communication that has to happen. And it needs to happen where those teams are, as opposed to making them all come back to the nursing station. Yeah. So they need to have the communication go with them wherever it is that they go, so they don't have to stop what they're doing, interrupt that cognitive flow, and move and figure out how to make that communication happen. Okay. Another way that uh, we can lighten the load on nurses is by incorporating nurse extenders. Now, a nurse extender is any tool or technology that allows the nurse to have the information they would have at the bedside, even when they're not at the bedside. Okay. So imagine, for example, a smart bed. A smart bed can let a nurse know if a patient who is at high risk for falls is about to get out of bed, or a patient who needs to be turned to prevent pressure injuries hasn't been turned in a long time. That nurse doesn't have to go to the bedside to find that out. They can be alerted via their integrated communication technology to know that that's about to happen and intervene as needed, as opposed to having to have hands-on at all times. So you can imagine how that also gives her peace of mind so she's not worrying so much and spending cognitive resources on wondering how long she can leave the bedside without risking a patient fall or a pressure injury. Another example of lightening the load. Yes, absolutely. So one of the other things that leaders can do is innovate current care models. 
I said before that just because something's been done one way doesn't mean we need to do it that way forever. And by bringing nurses to the table to think about how do we redesign care, we can build processes that work within people's cognitive capacity. So for example, one of the most intensive, time intensive and brain intensive processes that nurses go through is admission and discharge. At admission, they've got to get up to speed on a new patient, make sure that they're covering all of the things that get that patient safely tucked into that unit. At discharge, they've got to track down labs and signatures and orders and just make sure that, again, the patient is safe to go home. So what some systems are doing is introducing a dedicated discharge and admissions nurse who uses telecommunications or video conferencing to connect and take care of all those time-intensive tasks so that the frontline nurses can be working on the rest of the daily management tasks that they do for, uh, for all of their patients. And Liz, do you have an example of a hospital or healthcare system that you've worked with that has implemented something like this previously? Yeah, one system that I worked with actually brought nurses and nurse leaders to the table to redesign the entire process of nursing. We have so many best practices in nursing from bedside shift report to dedicated med pass to, um, uh, to hourly rounding. And each of those has a reason for existing and it has a purpose that, that is, is good and needs to be, needs to be focused on. But when we've piled them all on top of each other, what we end up with is a, a set of processes that nobody can succeed at doing. So those leaders got together with their frontline teams and said, how do we get those outcomes without slavishly sticking to each of those processes? And they created a more streamlined approach that was actually setting up their teams for success and working within their cognitive capacity. Taking a lot of chaos and streamlining it. Exactly. So designing the environment so that there's not so much extraneous load that those cognitive resources can be focused where they should be focused. That makes a lot of sense. Another uh, area that people can look at is offloading tasks. So there are things that nurses do today that don't require a nursing license. And at a time where nurses are at a premium, where we just don't have enough nurses to do the nursing care, we can't afford to have RNs doing works that you, work that you don't need a license to do. And that doesn't only mean offloading to other care team members, right? LVNs, LPNs, patient care techs, they are amazing. They help nurses do their jobs and manage some of that cognitive burden. But patients and families can do some of that work as well. So for example, a patient with diabetes who's been stable with diabetes for a long time knows how to do their finger sticks and check their insulin. And Right now, we have a requirement in most hospitals that the nurses perform that task, mostly so we make sure it gets done. Well, we could also make sure it gets done by having a way for the patient to document that at the bedside so the nurse knows it's happening, but the nurse isn't having to take that effort, remember to make sure it happens, and checking the data to know what it means. And bringing in the family for care. Right. Hopefully. So another, another hospital system that I worked with created a process they called Partners in Caring. They did this in their ICU. Now it's important, every, when they designed this, they designed it with their frontline nurses. Okay. So every care environment is a little bit different. And what's going to be comfortable to offload is going to need input from those frontline nurses. But what they did with Partners in Caring is they offered family members the opportunity to participate in their loved one's care. And so they might be helping with hygiene, brushing teeth, washing hair, um, even positioning, right? Making sure that they've got their moved so they don't get pressure ulcers. And sometimes even with things like dressing changes. And what that did was not only lighten the load on nurses in terms of workload and what they needed to remember, because it was all well documented, but it also meant that when those family members went home with their loved ones, they felt way more confident taking care of them, way more familiar with what those processes looked like. And so they actually lowered their readmissions and reduced the complication rates post-hospitalization. So it was really a win-win for everyone. That's a great story, too. Thank you. Another way to lighten the cognitive load is to empower nurses to manage some of their own processes and timing. For example, one of the things that nurses have very little control over is loved ones calling into the hospital to check on patients who they can't visit in person. Right? And we know that's really important, right? Of course, loved ones yeah. care. And nurses want to give them updates. They want them to know that, they're, that the patients in the hospital are, are doing well or have whatever updates they need. Now, if loved ones call in whenever they want to, then they interrupt whatever process is going on. Yeah. But if we can give nurses tools to schedule those outreaches, to schedule that communication, to let loved ones know, hey, your patient is doing great, or 
we've just come back from the MRI and everything looks good or whatever the update might be, then they can schedule that when it fits in their time instead of when it interrupts the process and increases that likelihood that they're going to forget some yeah. important piece of information, make a mistake, and then have to deal with all of the aftermath of that. Okay. So anything we can do to give nurses control over their environment and their uh, situation is fantastic. So I've just mentioned some things that are people-based, that are process-based, and they're technology-based. I want to really dig into technology, but I've covered a lot of ground. So I just want to remind everybody that they can ask questions. Get those questions ready. We'll be opening up for Q&A in just a little bit. Great reminder. Thank you, Liz. But let's actually look at how much people get frustrated with technology and blame it on cognitive overload because we love to blame technology for cognitive overload, yep. right? It's People talk about documentation, and documentation is challenging, but technology can be part of the solution as well. It's a big piece. It is a big piece. Yeah. So Becker's Hospital Review actually asked this question, to what degree is technology adding to the cognitive burden in your working environment? And people were able to say high, low, medium, not at all. Okay. What do you bet? Medium. Actually, the vast majority of people said it's, it's a high contributor to cognitive overload, and wow. most of the rest of them said medium. Only 1% said it doesn't contribute to, contribute to cognitive overload. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with technology. Okay. What this means is we're not designing technology well enough or integrating it well enough into the workflows, and what I mean that at a system level. Yep. So when we look at technology, the kinds of things that I'm talking about that can be solutions for that is things like hands-free technology for communication, yep. recognizing that nurses most of the time are using their hands to do their work. So if we can take the communication out of their physical hands, that's better. Looking at things like smart beds that are, as, as we said before, nurse yep. extenders yep. that allow nurses to have the information they would have at the bedside, even if they are somewhere else. So some systems are using barcode technology so that nurses can easily connect medications, um, clinical processes, and patients without having to write down or look up a lot of information to make that connection happen. Really, the fundamental connection of whether or not a technology is going to add to or, or reduce cognitive load centers on integration. So if a system is integrated, whether that's bedside vitals or a communication system, um, is integrated in with core hospital systems such as the EHR, that means nurses are going to have to take fewer steps to get the information that they need, communicate that information to others, or create the context they need to make sure that information makes sense and contributes to good patient care. Got it. So those are the technologies that exist. When we talk about optimizing those technologies, they need to be supporting nurses. So they need to be designed to streamline that workflow as opposed to just introduced haphazardly into it, right? We need to have nurses involved in the selection of and the, and the rollout of technology. So if you're a nurse leader, you can be thinking about making sure you have a good relationship with your CNIO or your CIO so that when technologies are selected, there are nurses at the table helping to make that decision. And as they're rolled out, there are good feedback channels for nurses to say, this is working, this is not working, this needs to be changed, and that they can be constantly introducing the kinds of upgrades and, and um, streamlining of those solutions that make sure that that nurse's work is easier. For too long, we've, we've allowed systems and processes, each of which is well-intentioned, to be introduced into the care environment without recognizing what changes need to be, hap be happening overall and to make sure that they support allowing this flexibility and changes that are happening as we innovate care models and look at restructuring the way that care is delivered. That makes a lot of sense. So technology should be part of the solution, and nurse leaders are part of making sure that happens. So as we wrap this up, just a couple of things that I want people to keep in mind. Cognitive load is true for everybody, right? We're not, it's not nurses, it's not doctors. Everybody's brains work in a certain way. They work in a way that allows small amounts of information to exist for short amounts of time in working memory. And so if we know that's true of human beings, we can design environments 
that work with those human capacities instead of constantly stretching them past their limits. So here's what I want people to take away from this conversation is if they can recognize cognitive limitations, which are universal, we can design systems that work within them. That then creates a foundation for strengthening nurse resilience, making sure that nurses can stay in the profession of nursing, which they've dedicated themselves to. Then we can address communication and workflow issues because communication is the foundation of how nursing care happens. On top of that strong foundation, we can innovate care models and the technologies that support them and empower nurses to delegate and make decisions so that they are more in control and can manage their cognitive resources effectively. When you talk about resources as well, are there resources available to me as a nurse today that exist within hospital systems? I mean, every hospital system is a little bit different, but yes, there are resources that nurses can use in multiple areas. First, most systems have some sort of well-being programs going on. So that first point of taking care of yourself in order to be a good advocate for system change, there are resources available. On the system change front, most systems also have departments that look at process improvement and process change, and they need to have nurses' voices at those tables because otherwise somebody else is going to design the process, and they don't know the work as well as nurses yeah. do. So nurses need to be a vital part of that. So yes, there are, there are resources in every hospital that nurses can be part of making the environment better and safer so that patient care is optimized and nurses can do their work without feeling overloaded all the time. And that's really why we're here, right? We're at a time in this moment of the healthcare system where we're experiencing a shortage of nurses, where nurses have been through so much in the pandemic, where there's so much need and possibly even appetite for system change. So now is the time for nurses and nurse leaders to step up, armed with knowledge about how, how minds work so that they can build processes that fit within cognitive resources and allow nurses to do the best possible work they can do and deliver amazing patient care. Perfect. Thank you so much, Liz. Thanks for having me, Katie. Yeah. Hi, everyone. This is Julie Cullen. I'm the managing editor of American Nurse Journal. I'm going to be moderating the Q&A portion of today's program. Liz, thanks for a great presentation. Are you ready for your first question? I am absolutely, Julian. Thank you so much for having me here today and to American Nurse Journal for helping us uh, bring this important topic to people. Thanks, Liz. Okay, for to, uh, the first question. Um, what is the best way to limit information overload day to day? So as we discussed in the webinar, there are both personal and systems contributors to cognitive overload. And it really takes a balance of both to stay in a healthy range of cognitive load. So as an individual taking breaks, and I mean true breaks, in which you let go of processing information, so not checking personal email or arranging childcare throughout the day is one of the more effective uh, ways that people can manage cognitive load and way more effective than powering through. Now, obviously, in order to do that, you know, nurses are probably rolling their eyes at me saying take breaks, there need to be system supports that uh, both create break spaces that are calming and allow for that, you know, letting go and building a culture that values breaks. Um, so anything that has to do with well-being is going to help manage that day-to-day -day cognitive load. But also learning communication tools, whether those are in the EHR or separate systems, can help de decrease that extraneous load. So that often means, from a system perspective, creating and using uh, learning updates or sharing best practices from power users to so that users uh, nurses can keep getting better with the tools that the system has invested in. And then some systems are also hiring human factors engineers. These are scientists who are trained to assess and design environments so that they work within cognitive limits. Um, and they help with process improvement in a way that explicitly designs so that uh, we're not constantly creating cognitive load with either the technologies, the processes, or the team approaches that, that we use. Thanks, Liz. Before I go to the next question, um, a few people have been asking if um, this webinar will be available um, to view later, and yes, it will. Um, we're going to be sending everybody a link to the on-demand webinar so you can watch it again later. Um, let's look at our next question. Um, at times, technology may go down 
and add nurses load, add to nurses, nurses load, what can be done about it? And do you have any thoughts? No, that's a, that's a great question. And one that I'm not an IT expert, so I don't completely have, um, have the answers to, but certainly, you know, partnering with IT, if this is happening frequently within your system, then escalating up to senior leadership to say that this is, this is, causing damage at the front lines that there it's not possible to keep moving forward um, is is really going to be important because the last thing that we want from a cognitive load perspective is for people to create redundant systems right if you have a technology system that's not reliable then people start writing things down or creating workarounds. And what that means is that there's extra extraneous cognitive load when they have to think about, can I lean on the system or should I use my workaround approach? So that's definitely something that should be escalated to a CNIO, a CIO, um, even to a CEO level to say, uh, we need to make sure that we have system reliability. Good advice. Um, Another questioner, another audience member, is noting that at some hospitals, the culture of the hospital doesn't really encourage encourage nurses um, to take breaks. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, and and that's so. I I've seen that a lot, uh, and I've seen that both from front lines and from uh, leadership levels, right? So, and I and I'm I always want to be cautious. I never want to feel like. There's a blame and shame approach here, but but I, I also want to make sure we're talking about things in an empowering way, right? If there's if things can only be addressed at a leadership level, then it feels like nurses are victims. And I've never met a nurse who didn't have, you know, gumption, creativity, um, you know, capability to move forward. Yeah. So in terms of that culture, some of it is working with each other, right? Any local culture can make sure that there's space for short breaks. And from a cognitive load perspective, it can be as short as 90 seconds to reset your cognitive capacity and start to feel like you can handle things again. From a systems perspective, that really is a culture thing, and it has to do with staffing, but it also has to do with creating processes and creating and investing in support resources, whether those be technology, um, LPNs, LVNs, uh, techs, what have you, to ensure that there is a sense of room in the day that people can take some time away from their direct responsibilities. And to do that, you have to trust as a, as a nurse that your team members are going to carry things just as well as, as you have, as you would, knowing your patients. So it can also be local nurse units creating uh, uh, protocols for when they're going to hand a patient off to a team member so they can take a break, whether that's short or a little longer knowing what information they want to transfer, knowing what etiquette there is around escalating. So if they're taking a break, could you interrupt them and under what circumstances? And just creating those norms and rules that say, this isn't about team members not being good enough to be able to do the work. It's a, it's a literal physiological human capacity question where everybody's brain needs to have time off in order to function optimally. So when hospital leaders do create strategies for managing cognitive overload and overcoming communication challenges, how do they make sure those strategies stick? And um, what can they do to support staff during the transition? That's a great question, Julie. And anytime you introduce a new solution into the care environment, or really any environment, there's a short-term increase in cognitive load while people learn the new system and transfer its use and how it works into their long-term memory. So I think one thing is knowing that no matter what change processes you're putting in place, it's harder before it's easier. And that means um, that depending on the magnitude of the change, leaders may need to reduce load in other areas by augmenting staff, eliminating tasks, um, organizing when change rollout happens, et cetera, until the change becomes the new normal. And then in addition, when any change is rolling out, team members should have clear avenues in which to share feedback, request changes, and implement improvements. And when we're talking about changes around communication and collaboration, which are often you know, big components of cognitive load, um, that often affects different team members differently. So just thinking, for example, about something like secure text messaging. Secure text messaging may be extremely helpful for nurses who are seeking access to physicians, but on the flip side of that, it's interruptive to physicians in a way that increases their cognitive load. 
So part of the change process may need to be some agreements on etiquette, on how to best use tools, how to work through the new processes so that they balance the needs of different team members because you know, not every team member has the same experience. Um, we have time for one more question, and I think it will be helpful to all the audience members to just kind of differentiate or explain the differences between burnout and cognitive overload. Um, one of the audience members asked, are they the same? That's a, that's a really important question, Julie. I'm really glad we have time to address it. And the, the short answer is no. So long-term cognitive overload, so repeatedly experiencing cognitive overload can contribute to burnout. But burnout is a more complex workplace injury. And the, the definition by Maslach and Leiter when they first created this was that it includes exhaustion, cynicism, and a sense of inefficacy. And that's actually how the World Health Organization defines it now. So the contributors to burnout, in addition to things like cognitive load and work overload, are things like a lack of control, insufficient reward, breakdown in community, an absence of a perceived fairness and conflicting values. So you can see when I, if you think about that list, cognitive overload is both a direct contributor to burnout because it causes fatigue, it causes that um, just you know inability to process more information, but it also makes a lot of other contributors more challenging. So for example, it's harder to engage in community or grapple um, fairly with ethical issues when you're cognitively overloaded. So it, they're not synonymous, but they are interconnected. And I think it's important as leaders are looking at strategies for team member safety and well-being that they recognize that different components are going to require different solutions. Now, when I say that, that doesn't mean that we foist you know, a hundred different solutions on the front lines. It's a leadership responsibility to, to address change in a way that hits on multiple aspects and elements of burnout, including cognitive load, as they're looking to make these changes take place. Thanks, Liz, that was really helpful. And thank you for your time today. This was a great presentation and thank you audience members for joining us today. Everybody have a great afternoon. Thank you so much, Julie, and thank you again to American Nurse Journal and happy Nurses Week to all the nurses out there. We're so grateful for what you do every day. Absolutely, thank you.